The first half of the 1930s was the golden age of the airship. It was dominated by the mighty German Zeppelins, Graf Spee and Hindenburg. They regularly flew passengers across the Atlantic in great comfort. But at the beginning of the decade, it appeared that Britain might become the leader in airship travel. Britain had built two airships, the R-100 and R-101. But their dream of dominating the skies ended in October 1930, when the R-101 crashed in France on its maiden flight to India. It was a disaster caused by design blunders, but the underlying cause was the ambition of one man who was convinced that airships would safeguard the future of the British Empire. The first successful powered airships were built at the turn of the century. One pioneer was Brazilian Alberto Santos Dumont, who in 1901 amazed Parisians by flying around the Eiffel Tower. In Germany, Count von Zeppelin built a series of airships which came to bear his name. Within a decade, these provided commercial service between German cities. During World War I, both sides used airships. Zeppelins mounted bombing attacks against targets in Britain and France. Allied airships patrolled the seas. It became clear that airships had superior endurance and range compared to aircraft. They were potentially valuable as the long-haul air transport vehicles of the future. At the end of the war, the British accepted the challenge to develop airships as passenger vehicles. In 1919, the airship R-34 successfully flew to the United States and back. The outbound flight took 108 hours. The return trip was helped along by a tailwind and took just 75 hours. The R-38 followed. It was completed in 1921 and was the largest airship of its day. But there was a loss of interest and cutbacks in public spending, and the airship was sold to the United States. Unfortunately, before the R-38 was delivered, it broke in two during an acceptance flight. It plunged into England's River Humber in the north. Most of those on board died. The US then purchased a German Zeppelin, the ZR-1, which was renamed the Shenandoah. In 1924, Britain's newly elected socialist government reconsidered airships as a means of transportation. The driving force behind this was Britain's Secretary of State for Air, Lord Thompson, a former professional soldier who entered politics at the end of World War I. Thompson thought airships could be an ideal way to improve communication across the British Empire. He called for construction of two dirigibles, each capable of carrying 100 passengers in comfort. The cause of the earlier R-38 disaster was thought to be its flimsy construction, so the specifications of the new airships required that they be both strong and rigid. Two separate contracts were placed. One airship would be built by the Airship Guarantee Company, a subsidiary of the Vickers Armament Firm.
The other was to be built with public money by the newly created Royal Airship Works at Cardington, Bedfordshire, north of London. Development slowed when Britain's Labour Party lost power in the government in late 1924. But it quickened once more when Labour returned to office in 1928. The renewed activity was solely due to the determination of Lord Thompson, once again Minister for Air, who had based his reputation on building a fleet of Imperial airships. One reason for this was that Germany had recently constructed a new airship, the Graf Zeppelin. Not only did it successfully fly across the Atlantic, but it also flew around the world. This once again seemed to promote Germany's dominance in building airships and made Thompson even more determined to put Britain in the lead. But Thompson's blind determination made him impatient. This in turn pressured the builder of Britain's publicly funded airship, the R-101, and would lead to a series of ultimately fatal blunders. As a socialist politician, Lord Thompson believed in the strength of state industry. He was determined that the government-built R-101 proved superior to its privately built rival. The privately funded Vickers venture was known as R-100. By 1928, it began to take shape. Its chief designer was a man called Barnes Wallace, who would later become famous for his bouncing bomb, effective against German dams during World War II. Wallace's project showed promise, although he had a limited budget and the demands for added strength made the R-100 airship some 25% heavier than it needed to be. In contrast, the R-100's government-backed rival, the R-101, was designed by a committee and subject to bureaucracy, which included numerous official inspections. Unlike R-100, the R-101 was constructed amid a blaze of publicity engineered by Thompson. Announcements were made about the use of experimental techniques and materials which put the R-101 on the cutting edge of technology. These included specially designed gas valves and sophisticated servo controls for elevators and rudders. Many of these innovations were not only expensive, they were virtually unworkable. Thompson wanted to use the publicly funded R-101 to establish an air route to India long considered the jewel of the British Empire's crown. Gasoline was dismissed as too dangerous to use as a fuel in the tropics because it was believed that it increased the risk of fire in hot climates. The R-101 was instead fitted with diesel engines. They were still in an early stage of development and were underpowered and excessively heavy. The R-100, which was to be used for flights to Canada, was allowed to use gas engines. These enabled it to fly at over 80 miles per hour, while R-101's diesels could achieve no more than 72 miles per hour. By autumn 1929, both airships had been completed, but it soon became clear that the R-100 was superior in all respects. When the R-101 was shown at Britain's Hendon Air Pageant in the early summer of 1930, little did the spectators realize that it was grossly underpowered and overweight. The R-100, on the other hand, despite government attempts to delay it, completed a highly successful transatlantic round-trip flight to Montreal, Canada in July 1930.
While in Canada, the airship carried out a number of demonstration flights. That included a flight over Niagara Falls. Britain seemed on course to regain the lead over Germany's airship industry. In the meantime, air safety inspectors warned Lord Thompson that the R-101 could not fly to India in its present state because it weighed too much and lacked power. Determined not to be upstaged by the R-100, Thompson ordered a crash course of modifications. The R-101 was lightened as much as possible and also cut in half so that an extra gas bag could be installed. This, it was hoped, would give the airship much needed lift. Lord Thompson's impatience was now fueled by another factor. He had heard that he was being considered as the next Viceroy of India, the most prestigious post in the British Empire. To further his cause, Thompson wanted to fly to India in R-101 and return in time for the Imperial Conference, a meeting of the political heads of the British Dominions. This was scheduled for the second half of October 1930 in London. Thompson's trailblazing flight would, he believed, secure his post governing over India. With all the modifications that were being made, there was little time to ready the R-101 for its epic flight, which was scheduled for October 4th. There was only time for one test flight. On October 2nd, two days before the flight to India, the R-101 was reluctantly granted its certificate of airworthiness. Since the air safety inspectors were part of Britain's Ministry of Air, they felt forced to grant Thompson's wishes in spite of their doubts. Others were also concerned about the safety of the R-101 and her ability to make such a long and arduous flight. These fears were more than justified and would soon be realized in a terrible way. Britain's Lord Thompson invited 11 distinguished guests to fly with him aboard the R-101 on her inaugural flight to India. Guests included Air Marshal Sir Sefton Branker, the Director of Civil Aviation and a very experienced aviator. Thompson was determined that his guests should want for nothing during the flight. So the airship was loaded with every form of luxury. This added unnecessary weight. Concern for r 101s safety increased. Branker even recommended that the flight be postponed. But Thompson refused to listen. The crew posed for the media. Many of them were experienced at flying airships. The R-101's captain, Major G.H. Scott, had been one of the officers aboard the R-34 during her 1919 double crossing of the Atlantic. He would surely get her to India. The R-101 left its mooring mast at Cardington on the afternoon of October 4, 1930, with 12 passengers, including Lord Thompson and Air Marshal Branker, as well as 42 crew members. The flight path of R-101 took her over France, across the Mediterranean to Egypt, and then on to India. After flying over London and the English Channel, the R-101 reached the French coast. The crew found the airship hard to control. Its excessive weight and underpowered engines made it difficult to gain altitude. 
but Thompson refused to turn back. Then, at 1.55 a.m. on October 5, 1930, the R-101 suddenly plunged toward the ground and exploded outside the French town of Beauvais. Only seven men survived. Among the dead were both Sir Sefton Branker and Lord Thompson. It was the worst air disaster in the world to date. Led to believe that R-101 was indestructible, the British were shocked by the disaster. Coffins containing the bodies of the 48 men who had perished in the R-101 tragedy were taken aboard a British warship. This would transport them back across the English Channel to their homeland. The coffins were met by a nation in mourning. Throughout Britain, flags were at half-mast. The R-101's dead were given a mass state funeral. The funeral symbolized the end of Thompson's dream of dominating the skies with airships. The R-100, which showed much more promise than the R-101, was not allowed to fly again. It was sold for scrap, and no other British airships were built. The loss of the R-101 was the result of design blunders. Too many impractical innovations were incorporated into the airship. She was overweight and underpowered, and her development suffered at the hands of government bureaucracy. She never should have been allowed to fly to India. But the root cause can be laid at the feet of one overambitious man who refused to listen to others. Lord Thompson paid the ultimate price for his stubbornness. Elsewhere, the airship dream lived a bit longer. In the United States, the Navy was the custodian of airships. Airships were used for maritime patrol and fleet reconnaissance. But in 1925, the Navy had lost its airship, the Shenandoah, which had been purchased from Germany. Due to excessive air turbulence, she plunged to the ground, just as R-101 would five years later. Undeterred, the U.S. Navy ordered two more rigid airships for long-range maritime patrolling. They were named the Akron and the Macon. The Akron plunged into the sea off New Jersey in April 1933. Only three out of the 76 men on board survived. Two years later, in April 1935, the Macon suffered the same fate. For the time being, this put an end to the U.S. Navy's interest in airships. That left only the Germans. Their Graf Zeppelin was still flying, carrying passengers between Europe and South America. In 1936, she was joined by the massive Hindenburg, which began service between Germany and Lakehurst, New Jersey. She quickly proved popular. But these airships only ran during the summer, since the danger of adverse weather in the winter was too great. The Hindenburg made her first flight of the 1937 season in the first week of May. But as she approached her Lakehurst mooring post, she suddenly erupted into flames.
A number of people survived, but the Hindenburg disaster extinguished the dream of making airships the queens of the skies. The US, British, and German tragedies confirmed that airships were too vulnerable to the elements and human error to provide reliable transportation. From then on, the airplane would dominate the skies.